it is quite a very special, it's a very a special event. We will be having a, a, an ideas public forum that talks on ensuring GLC reforms in the times of government change. At the same time, in conjunction with our Pantau Kwasa launch. Now, uh, Pantau Kwasa launch is one of the first initiatives of Ideas Malaysia to explore on civic tech in which we have created and crafted a portal uh, that will create a, an interactive discussion and sharing of information uh, of our research to the public. And in this Pantau Kwasa launch, the strength of the website is to actually to track on Malaysia's political appointment uh, in GLCs in the country. So if you do have a chance while listening to the forum today, I would like to uh, urge each and every one of us to have a look at pantaukwasa.org. I'll spell it again for all of us here today. It's pantau, P-A-N-T-A-U, kwasa, K-U-A-S-A. -A, those are in one word, dot O-R-G. So it's a very interactive website. As you are seeing the website right now, there's a buzzing uh, KL City in the evening. So very wonderful. Credits to the PFU team as well as the ER team for organizing this website. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to call upon uh, the CEO of Ideas Malaysia, Trisha Yeo, to deliver her welcoming remarks. Over to you, Trisha. Hey, good morning, everyone, and good morning to Professor Terence Gomez, maybe Dr. Ong Kian Ming, our panelists for today, um, friends, colleagues, and all attendees, uh, members of the media, and uh, other friends. So um, today, we're really excited uh, to launch this website that we have been working on, the team has been working on very hard over the last few months. Um, it's pantalkwasa.com, yeah, C-O-M, uh, not O-R-G, and we are... I think it's, it's not the first time that um, visualizations have been used to track um, political appointees across the system, but it's the first time that Ideas is doing it. And I think also the first time that we're trying to really map it out according to um, the different administrations. So if you check out the website and later, there will be my colleague um, Ali Iskandar who will go through the website with you. Uh, there's very nice visualizations. Um, there are some questions and uh, insights on what, how to make sense of all the detail and the data that is presented in the website. And the website essentially looks at political appointments in three administrations under uh, the sixth prime minister, the seventh and the eighth. Um, and based on what you see on the website, it's very clear which of the prime ministers actually had uh, the largest politi political appointments during their tenure. Uh, so I, I won't want to take too much time because I know that you're all here to listen to uh, YB Dr. Ankian Ming and, and, and Professor Terence Gomez as well, who are, uh, you know, Prof. Terence has uh, done a lot of research and work on this area. But I just want to, um, to state a few things about where IDEAS is when it comes to GLCs. IDEAS has been working on researching GLCs or in better known terms, state-owned enterprises over the last five to eight years, um, primarily when Prof. Terence Gomez himself was our senior fellow, we embarked on a very ambitious project at a time when few think tanks and research organizations were not just interested, but also had the appetite to do this sort of very important research. Um, this resulted in a book published by Ideas and Gerard Budaya, uh, the local version, and this was the Minister of Finance Incorporated. Uh, following that, we had several reports as well that mapped out the entire ecosystem um, of GLCs in various ways. You're talking about publicly listed GLCs, um, state-owned state meaning at the state government level GLCs. Um, and this mapping out is actually crucial data for anyone who's interested in not just the political appointments part, of GLCs, which is the website we're launching today, but also beyond that, a mapping out of the entire um, economic ecosystem, where does the power, the nexus of power and control lie when it comes to um, corporate Malaysia. Um, I think we all, Malaysia, just saw and witnessed the launch and the announcement of the 12th Malaysia plan yesterday. 
in Parliament, which is going to be hotly debated for the rest of the, the next two weeks or so. Uh, we can see in the 12th Malaysia Plan as well that this current administration places a lot of emphasis on GLCs, where GLCs continue to play an important role in shaping the economic future of Malaysia's post-pandemic world. In fact, um, they, they seem to accept the reality and wanting to, um, to push the GLCs to do even more to contribute to our economic growth. Um, and then part of that, what we're happy to see um, is that there is some emphasis on the corporate governance um, of SOEs and GLCs. There's even a whole section dedicated, uh, one paragraph talking about the need for merits and transparency um, in, the, in the appointments of the board members within GLCs. Um, all this is very good. I mean, I think it's at least it's putting it, putting the commitments of paper on paper. Uh, however, of course, these fall short in terms of how they're actually going to do this and whether or not there is political will to do that, uh, bearing in mind that political appointments uh, have been the modus operandi for all administrations in the past, um, including under the Pakatan Harapan administration. Uh, apart from the 12th Malaysia plan, of course, the government has also launched, um, prior to the change in prime ministership, the Perkuko plan, which looks at reforming of the GLICs, and the GLCs plan is supposed to follow thereafter. Um, these are, again, recognition of the important role GLCs have played in the history of Malaysia and will continue to play, um, wanting to see economic efficiency emerging out of GLCs, that is uh, something that we also look forward to. We don't want to see any more wastage and inefficiencies emerging from GLCs. And at, as I said, at the time of a post-pandemic period, this will be increasingly important. So the governance measures are even more essential now than ever. Uh, finally, I just want to say, why is it that we believe political appointments can be problematic? They may not always be, but they have a great potential to be, essentially because when the politicians sit on these boards and uh, not necessarily all um, of them will exercise this, but the potential of them to exercise decision-making which goes into benefiting a, a certain political party that they are affiliated with, that's where the potential of conflict of interest can come about. Um, I, per, I perhaps, uh, you know, we, we would ask YB Ong Kian Ming on his opinion of this um, in a short while. Uh, I have also said in some of my remarks previously that the emphasis should be given to the chair, where the chairs of uh, especially large companies play a much bigger role than just being a member of the board, because chairs essentially set the direction of companies. They make decisions. Um, if there's a dispute within the board, the chairs ultimately make the decisions over where resources need to be allocated. And we know that there's a scarcity of resources. So um, with all, the, all of these points laid out, just for an initial preview of the discussion that is to come, um, I look forward to the discussion, the debate. Um, I'll end by saying that uh, where we are at is that we recognize that GLCs can play an important role, but I think it's also equally important to have a deep dive analysis as to whether how the performance has been in the past in order for us to evaluate what role they can play in the immediate as well as the long-term future. And um, if political appointments emerge with conflicting decision-making processes that hamper the ability of GLCs to deliver on the economic efficiency that we need in order for recovery, then this is why uh, this is an ongoing problem. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ideas will continue to, to work on GLCs, and uh, I hope that you continue to follow us as we do more in the near future. Thank you very much. Back to you, Zofri. Thank you, Tricia. All right. Um, right. Again, uh, once more, uh, we would like to also promote the, the, the website or the launch of pantaukwasa.com. Com, that is C-O-M, it's not as O-R-G as I said before. So yeah, please feel free to go with the website uh, as you may feel comfortable to do so. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, uh, we would like to welcome Yang Berholmat, Dr. Ong Kiang Mint, the Member of Parliament for Bangi uh, for his presentation. Over to you, YB. Uh, thank you very much, Azopi. Thanks to Ideas for 
uh, allowing me to share this platform with uh, other distinguished guests, uh, namely uh, Dr. Terence. Uh, good to see all of you. Uh, I may be a bit distracted because I have an eye on the screen. Uh, I am supposed to, I, I'm going to Parliament uh, after this to answer, to ask for the second question to be answered uh, on uh, Act 446 or the minimum worker standard. So I, I need to quickly finish up my presentation, ask my question, get my answer, and then I'll come back again for further discussion. Okay, uh, I'm just going to make three, uh, what start off with the definitional point first uh, before going to make uh, three points about GLC transformation uh, and then also highlight three challenges. Uh, the first one I think is a very important definitional point. Uh, and I think it is incumbent on, uh, you know, politicians, uh, academics such as uh, uh, Terence, as well as think tanks such as ideas, uh, to make sure that uh, in your communication about GLCs and GLICs, uh, that uh, it, it is uh, part of and parcel of a larger educational process for the people who read your work. So, for example, when I think about GLCs, uh, the way I define GLCs uh, in this context, uh, in the, uh, this discussion, would be uh, those companies uh, where uh, the government has uh, either a majority stake or a controlling stake or a golden share, right? This uh, and many of these companies that we are interested in would be uh, public listed companies. And I think this is one area where uh, you know, Terence has covered a lot. Uh, so I do not include uh, statutory bodies, uh, you know, basically any uh, sort of like organization that is, that is uh, you know, um, formed by uh, an act of parliament, you know, and there are many, uh, you know, so for example, all the public universities, they are actually statutory bodies, they have different boards that are in there, uh, you know, that where political appointments can uh, often are made. Uh, bodies such as PDPTN is also a statutory body, uh, you know, and uh, for full disclosure, I was a, a director in PDPTN when PH was in power. Uh, so uh, I think, and, and also, uh, you know, I, I do not cover uh, or include the Ministry of Finance incorporated uh, own companies. 1MDB, uh, Prasarana, you know, there's a lot of other these types of companies. Yes, they do require scrutiny, uh, but I think it's much more useful to separate uh, the discussion, uh, policy discussions with regards to those companies uh, that are, uh, you know, publicly listed, uh, you know, and not, and, and those that are statutory bodies versus those that are privately owned by Ministry of Finance, because each one of them would have different objectives uh, different uh, governance standards, uh, different levels of transparency, uh, which requires uh, different frameworks of analysis. So that's a definitional point. And I do want to take note that in Pantau Kwasa, uh, you've included uh, statutory bodies as well as uh, some MWM companies in your in your uh, you know presentation or your graphical depiction, right? So that's that's something that you may want to uh, you know uh, edit or, or or change along the way, um, or fine tune along the way, I should say. Okay, so the three points that I want to talk about in terms of GLC transformation uh, is firstly, I am in broad agreement with the general trust and direction uh, of the GLC transformation program that started actually since part last time. Uh, this was uh, uh, about 2004 and 2005 when there was a concerted effort to try to professionalize and transform uh, the GLCs, especially the publicly listed ones, uh, those where uh, Kazana and uh, PNB have a majority or important stakes in. Uh, you know, you're talking about your Saim Darbys, your, uh, your Axiatas, your Maxis, you know, uh, you know and, and so on and so forth, uh, uh, Telecom, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, there were a number of uh, books that were published under this GLC transformation program. You had the blue book, the green book, the red book. The red one is probably of more importance to ideas because it uh, concerns uh, procurement practices within these GLCs. And then later on, you know, it was upgraded. Uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, additional books were included. For example, silver book for CSR, uh, you know, initiatives, uh, white book for, uh, you know, regulation, uh, government regulations, and then a yellow book, I think, to sort of like, uh, tie everything up together. So I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would say that the um, outcome of this uh, GLC transformation program was uh, more, I, I think, quite successful across the board. Uh, you had uh, the transformation of some of the these GLCs into um, very credible regional players. So for example, uh, Cellcom being transformed into Axiata, you had CIMB uh, and to a lesser extent also Maybank going out to be, uh, you know, transform themselves into regional banks. Uh, 
uh, I think these are part and parcel of the uh, transformation process, which I think is important. Uh, of course, there will be some areas where there will be some misses, uh, you know, as well as the hits. And I think it's important to try to, uh, you know, uh, measure this kind of uh, performance of the different GLCs uh, along the way, uh, you know, uh, and, and this will be one point that I will talk about in terms of challenges. So that's the first one, uh, you know, the, the, the broad agreement with the uh, GLC transformation that started with Papla. Uh, the second, uh, you know, issue of GLC transformation that I want to highlight is with regards to my own personal experience uh, during the PH uh, government. Uh, the time was obviously very short. Uh, and I think the two things that I want to highlight that we tried to do uh, is firstly to leverage on the experience and expertise of some of the GLICs, uh, namely Kazana and EPF, uh, to achieve uh, better and more equitable social and economic uh, policies and outcomes. So we tapped on experts, uh, especially economic experts in Kazana, uh, some of the economic experts, uh, economists in EPF. And one of the things that we came up with during our time in power was uh, this uh, Malaysian at work, uh, you know, employment uh, subsidy uh, program uh, that was, uh, you know, so was supposed to have been uh, done in conjunction with EPF. Uh, before the, the fall of the PH government in March 2020. I think there are still elements in uh, the Malaysia Work Programme that uh, can be incorporated into Budget 2022. Uh, but of course, we do take note that some of these, uh, the proposals have been superseded by uh, Penjana Kerja Raya, a new uh, initiative uh, under, this, uh, under the previous government uh, and uh, also coordinated by Perkeso rather than EPF. Uh, so there were you know, these kinds of initiatives that, that were going on. Uh, the second area that we tried to improve it was in terms of uh, uh, making sure that uh, you know, we, we appoint professionals, uh, largely professionals uh, for the GLCs and the GLICs. I'm not talking about the stat bots, I'm not talking about uh, MBI Inc at the state level, you know, this purely at the, at the federal level. Uh, and uh, I think we did uh, our best uh, to be honest, uh, I think this was not uniformly implemented. Uh, there were still some appointments uh, that came in here uh, that I think were maybe uh, uh, not, not so uh, properly evaluated, I should say. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we did see some of the consequences after PH uh, fell out of power. Uh, so those are the two things. Of course, we could have done more uh, given uh, if we had more time. Uh, the third area that I want to highlight with regards to GLC transformation is, uh, is uh, maybe a, a, a hypothesis that I think uh, I largely agree with, uh, which is that professionalism uh, within the, these GLCs, uh, especially at the CEO and management level, I think has been instituted uh, to a large degree. Uh, this means that it's not so easy, for example, for uh, a politician to be appointed as the CEO of Tanaka or CEO of uh, EPF or CEO of uh, uh, TM, for example. Uh, I don't think politicians also want to have that kind of responsibility because these are very heavy responsibilities. Uh, and I think uh, we need to look at some of the pushbacks uh, that some of these GLCs uh, you know, had uh, with re in response to political appointments that uh, they did not agree with. So, for example, uh, No Omar, the Mamnu MP for Tanjong Karang, was appointed as chairman of MISC, and within 17 days, he actually uh, stepped down uh, because of the kind of pressures that uh, he faced uh, from within the board. So, I think that's something to be uh, that, that's worth uh, discussing. Okay, the three challenges uh, I want to highlight are the following. Uh, rather than just focus on the appointments of uh, certain people or individuals uh, to GLCs, uh, I think we need to uh, look at ways in which we measure the performance of uh, the management team, uh, the chairman, uh, the, the, the organizations that we're interested in, uh, in terms of the different GLCs. Uh, and of course, this uh, will go into the details of what do you mean uh, by performance? Is it shareholder returns? Is it profitability? Is it growth in terms of revenue? Right, uh, and, and this is actually important in terms of trying to tie in with some of the objectives uh, that, uh, that are put forth in the uh, various uh, books under the GLC transformation program. And then now moving forward, uh, per Kuko. Okay, the second point I want to make is how do we actually uh, balance priorities uh, within GLICs uh, as well as GLCs? Right, because there will be a strong sort of like imperative from the government for some level of uh, uh, you know, service to society to be undertaken. So we see, for example, Tanaga offering, uh, you know, quite a, quite a bit uh, of discounts uh, during the MCO period of time uh, to help the B40, to help consumers. Uh, but at the same time, we do see other GLC, GLCs like 
uh, TM, for example, are not, not offering uh, that much discounts uh, to the B40, right? So what are some of the priorities uh, you know, within GLCs and GLICs? Profitability versus social responsibility. I think this is an important question that needs to be answered. And then the third one, uh, which I think is very interesting, uh, you know, as a policymaker and somebody who is interested in the corporate sector, how do we actually coordinate, uh, you know, competition and cooperation between the GLICs uh, and and also uh, related uh, the GLCs? Because this is part and parcel of Perkoko. Some of the objectives outlined in Perkoko is to actually uh, talk about. Uh, how to actually set goals and targets for GLICs, for GLCs. Uh, so, for example, we know, you know some of the banks, uh, CIMB is seen as a Kazana bank, uh, Maybank is seen as a PNB bank. You know, how do you want to coordinate these kinds of uh, competition and cooperation between GLICs, between GLCs? You have uh, many uh, GLCs that are involved in the property sector, in healthcare, and so on and so forth, right? So how do we actually want to uh, outline the details uh, with regards to cooperation and competition, uh, you know, uh, in the framework of Pococo. And I'll, 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 I'll stop uh, here with a final example, which may be relevant to Terence's uh, presentation later, uh, which is one of the things I tried to do when I was Deputy Minister of BT, was to coordinate efforts uh, of the GLICs and GLCs in terms of outbound investments to China. And what I found was that Malaysia actually doesn't have a coordinated strategy uh, you know, in terms of encouraging uh, big companies to lead the way for smaller companies to go into different uh, industries and different geographical areas in, in China. Uh, this is actually, uh, you know, in compare, it's a, a big contrast when we compare to the strategy employed by the GLCs uh, in Singapore, where the government and the GLCs lead the way and then they will bring in other private players uh, to latch onto their coattails. Uh, so this may be something that our parents may want to discuss later on. So I need to go off to ask my question now. Uh, all the best and I'll see you in a while. Thanks. Thank you, Yamaru um, for the presentations. Um, you, you've set out the uh, GLC transformation as well as the three challenges uh, that we will reflect on the reforms that we have uh, at the moment. So without further ado, let's um, listen to uh, Professor Dr. Edmund Terence Gomez on his presentation. Over to you, Prof. Uh, thank you, Shukri. Let me just put up my slides. But... Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Ideas and Trisha for inviting me to speak at this forum. I would like to also add that uh, I owe a debt of gratitude to Ideas because as Trisha mentioned about five years ago in, when we started this work on GLCs and we were talking at that time that it was important for us to look at the GLCs mainly because of the 1MDB scandal but it was only one GLC. There were a whole other group of GLCs that were also deeply mired in scandals as well as in the economy. They were playing both important roles, but were also tools for the practice of patronage and corruption. The only institution that was willing to support our research was Ideas. So I remain, I'd like to thank them for supporting us. And I'd like to also congratulate them on continuing the work on GLCs even after I left uh, a senior fellow at Ideas. Now, having said that, let me get into the discussion today. What we're trying to do, what I was actually supposed to go first uh, this morning, and I want, but Ken Ming had to go off, so we let him speak first. What I wanted to do today really was to uh, allow you to have an understanding of this GLC world. Very few people really understand what this GLC world is all about. There are very few insights into it. But what is uh, really interesting is when the pandemic occurred, the GLC suddenly came to the fore. When the companies went into a lockdown, the government turned to the GLCs to prop up the economy. So as you can see here in the first slide, which I'm showing you, is this. While there's been a lot of talk about uh, bringing the private sector as the main engine of growth, the crisis put a stop to that. In fact, what happened post-crisis was the role of the government and the economy intensified. Now, the question we must then ask ourselves is, how does this government ecosystem, and here I'm quoting Tunku Zafrul because he used the word government ecosystem, he was referring to the GLCs. How are they being employed to deal with this crisis? So here, as you can see, some of the key concerns at the time, I'm not going to read them out to you, but also 
below that is the government ecosystem through which the government would intervene directly into the economy. As Ken Ming pointed out just now, we need to provide definitions for this term GLCs, and it includes many, many different types of institutions, all of them lumped together as GLCs, and I'll get into the definitions later. But first, I want to go into the most recent thing that the government introduced. Now, when the government uh, intervened more forcefully in the economy to save the economy, to help the people during the pandemic crisis, what is very clear is this. Let me go back to this first. What is very clear is this. They it was, as uh, Ken Ming also pointed out, it was clear that they could use these uh, government-linked companies, especially the publicly listed companies, the banks, for example. Tanaga was used to help people in need. What is also important is, not long later, after this was done, the government then went on to appoint politicians as directors of these GLCs. So on one hand, while the government recognized, and this I'm talking about the Mohitian government, that the GLCs could be used to save the economy, subsequently, Mohitian, to consolidate his position, also began to use the GLCs as a mechanism to provide directorships, to consolidate directorships to politicians, to consolidate his own position. Moving forward, to just about two months ago, the government began to realize the economy now was in a serious crisis. The GLCs were not performing as the, the way in which they should. And they went back to a discussion on the government ecosystem. And from there emerged the Pakuko plan. What is very clear is that the government realized that if they, with this prolonged MCO and with companies now really in dire straits, the government had to go back and employ these GLCs far more effectively. Here I'm putting up a diagram of uh, very broadly speaking, what are the uh, main dimensions, the five main dimensions of the Pakuko plan. What is also important here, and here I want to relate this to what Ken Ming also said earlier, is this. Abdullah, when he came to power, instituted a DLC reform plan, but it basically targeted the G the GLICs, the government linked investment companies, as well as the publicly listed firms. Interestingly enough, when we look at the Pakuko plan, it also talks only about the GLICs. In fact, they don't even talk much about the G publicly listed GLCs. There's no discussion on any other GLCs that I mentioned earlier, and I go back to such as uh, the statutory bodies, the SEDCs, the state cooperative agencies, uh, and the um, companies under the control of the ministries. I'll come, come to that again later, as I said. So here, what do we see with the Pakuko plan? Pakuko is, plan is very interesting because they're looking at five major outcomes that they want. Clarity, the mandate of each GLIC. Now, this is an admission that the GLICs, the mandate that they have and what exactly they do is not clear. They do many things. And I'll show you that also again later. The second point, this is very important to spur new growth and enhance socio-economic impact. I'm stressing socio-economic impact. They recognize that they have a social role to play as well as an economic role to play. And this was very evident post-pandemic. The third point, they want to crowd in the private sector. Previously, as you know, the, the, the discussion whenever we talk about GLCs and government intervention is how they crowd out the private sector how they crowd out in particular the SME sector. Here, there's a concerted attempt, as they put it, to crowd in. That means it's going to be a sort of public-private partnership of sorts. Huh? Crowd in means the government will play a big role to try and enhance and support the private sector, specifically the SMEs. Why the SMEs? Because they constitute 98.5% of the corporate sector. They are, not, they are not major players in the sense in terms of the ownership and control of the corporate sector, but they are key actors in the economy in terms of employment and generating growth in different sectors of the economy. And also in terms of entrepreneurial capacity, new firms being set up, it will be seen primarily among the SME sector. So crowd them in, target them, support them. This is a good thing. And the fourth thing which they stressed, which is very important and we have to pay attention to this is, as they put it, uh, improve the governance, here, the capabilities and the strategies. Here, when they talk about governance, they are, only, they are not only talking about corporate governance, I would like to stress they're also talking about public governance. This is my interpretation. 
when we talk about governance, we're talking about different types of governance. So here on one hand, when we talk about companies, there's this corporate governance uh, reforms, which we saw on Dabdullah. But here there's also a stress on public governance. So there's greater clarity when we talk about governance. Second, the capabilities, the strategies. What most important is the strategies. What exactly are they doing? This comes back to the first point, clarity of purpose. What are they doing in the economy? That must be clear because they tend to do many things. And finally, strengthening uh, social safeguards and physical resilience. This is very important because, as you know, when we talk about the GLCs, the first thing that comes up is enormous leakages, serious corruption, abuse of power. So there is some attempt here to talk about uh, looking at this world very carefully to bring about reforms. And I applaud the government on introducing the core plan, but they're really short in terms of the implementation. How exactly are they going to go about doing this? And this is what we need to discuss. But here, let me go down now to the five-step method that we have, or oh, five, six-step method that we have to uh, implement the Pakuko. Now, the first thing, if you look at this, this is taken from the plan. The first thing that you'll see here in the first and second uh, aspects are establish an overarching development agenda. There must be an overall development agenda. There must be cohesion in terms of policies to be addressed. So the government comes up with public policies and they have an institutional architecture through which they implement this. That institutional architecture comprises this GLC world, of many different types of GLCs. Is this a good thing? Yes, this is a very good thing. We can't run away from the fact that this institutional architecture was created way back in 1970. When the government began to intervene through the new economic policy, they created this institutional architecture comprising all these different types of institutions. Those days, they were called public enterprises, statutory bodies, and so on and so forth. Now, they're all lumped together as GLCs. So there is an institutional architecture within government which you can break down. These are all different types of agencies which all have different roles to play. Who really coordinates all this? How do they use policies, they come up with policies, and how do they use these different institutions to implement these policies? This is what this is all about. But again, like I said, unfortunately for the Pakuko plan, they stress only the top level, the GLICs. We need to come bring this down further. This is why I am rather concerned with the inadequacies here in the Pakuko plan. Now, what they are going to do is, they say they will have a new growth coordination council. The thing about governments, uh, is that whenever they do something, they'll set up a committee or a council. Okay, fine. I really don't think this is what they need, but never mind. They'll have a new growth, and I like the term new growth. It suggests they're not just looking at existing sectors, they're looking at new industries that they need to focus on. This is important. When a government intervenes in an economy, the government is also trying to intervene in a way to nurture companies, to help companies go into new sectors of the economy, new areas of the economy the high tech sector. Usually the government will be a front runner and encouraging these types of uh, investments because they cost a lot of money. And then they bring in private enterprises to take over, to be uh, the beneficiaries of these uh, systems that they've created to allow for the development of these new sectors of the economy. Extremely important. So I like the idea of new growth, especially now in the post-pandemic period, where there's a lot of focus on technology, new technologies. The government has come up with a digital economic blueprint, very important. We have to look at the digital economic blueprint and see how it coordinates well with uh, the Pakuko plan. The digital economy blueprint, you will see, if you read it carefully, they stress the importance of using the government ecosystem, the GLCs. So at least here now, under the Ikatan government, there's some thinking how to use this government ecosystem far more effectively, how to connect them to new policies that they are creating. And I think that's a step in the right direction. And in that sense, uh, Tunku Zafru, I'm not surprised because Tunku Zafru comes from this GLC world. He has long been in the GLC world. He understands this GLC world in a way in which someone from the private sector will never understand it. So that probably gives some understanding as to why uh, these plans are coming about. He understands the problems there, the lack of coordination between these GLCs. Uh, Ken Ming mentioned it. There's so many different types of GLCs. There's competition between these publicly listed GLCs. There's no real common strategy by them. So how does all this function in the real world, in the real economy, in the 
there's a lot of thinking that needs to go into this. The second, the step three, which, uh, which is very important, I want to stress this, the whole government approach. This is very interesting. The stress on the word whole government, that means they are recognizing now that this government ecosystem that we have is huge, enormous. It's now coming out. It all used to be in the shadow. Now they are acknowledging there's a really huge government ecosystem and they're going to talk about a whole of government approach. Bring them all together. In other words, what they really need to do, which they haven't done here, and I'll stress this later, they need to map out this whole of government approach in terms of which are these different institutions within government that play a big role in the economy, which also have a social dimension to play. So this whole of government approach, I applaud this. I think this is good. It indicates an attempt to map out this government ecosystem and then to see how they can uh, utilize it far more effectively to ensure there's no overlapping, there's no leakages. Uh, if you take, for example, I'll just give you one example, the Tibet. When the Tibet was introduced, seven different, uh, numerous ministries were doing it, and there were about 70 agencies responsible for implementation of Tibet. It made absolutely no sense. It indicated no coordination, no dialogue even between the ministries on the implementation of such an important policy. The fourth one, they've got a budget for this. Six billion ringgit has been allocated for this. And I'm wondering how they exact how they how they are going to spend the six billion ringgit because that's not clear. The planning is vague uh, in terms of what is the six billion ringgit for in terms of how they're going to implement the Poku code. I'm saying this again because the plan is still very vague. But this is, like I said, an important plan. They have made an allocation for it. They're going to create a coordination council to ensure it's well implemented. The fifth one, implementation. This is the point I was just making. They talk about it, but again, there's little insight on implementation. There's also little insight when it comes to monitoring and evaluation. This is fundamental, monitoring. When you implement a public policy, you want to know the outcomes. You have to monitor to get the outcomes. Once you know the outcomes, the good and bad outcomes, the good outcomes carry on, improve on it, enhance it. Bad outcomes move immediately to rectify it. The bad outcomes is my primary concern. Are they monitoring the outcomes when they implement these policies? What are contributing to the out bad outcomes? Is it because the GLCs are not performing well or are there structural problems in the economy which they can't address? These are the issues we need to look into and address immediately so that we can ensure the implementation is productive. The outcomes are good for society and the economy. So here is a brief overview of the Pukuko plan. We are waiting for further information on this. And I hope the new government, this was done under the Mohidin government. I hope the new government under Ismail Sabri will continue to do this. I didn't see much discussion of this in the 12th Malaysia plan. So we've got to watch out for this. You know, where are they going with the Pukuko plan? But now that you know what the Pukuko plan looks like, and you know what the government had in mind, what is this government ecosystem all about? What are these GLICs, their focus? Now here in my book, uh, Minister of Finance Incorporated, they identified seven GLICs. GLICs are government-linked investment companies. These are very powerful companies, uh, powerful institutions, not companies, powerful institutions. Why did we pick these seven to do our analysis of uh, the Minister of Finance Incorporated? The, we return to Abdullah's plan. We return to what Abdullah identified under his reforms, what he identified as the GLICs. If you look at the Pakuko, however, Pakuko has identified more GLICs. They've classified others as GLICs. So here, this comes back to the problem of definition. Uh, can be correctly pointed out this definition. I can make my own definition of what is a GLIC, but there's no point in me making a definition of GLIC because it doesn't conform with what the government defines as GLICs. So I prefer to work with what the government defines as a GLIC. Unfortunately, the government also tends to change its definition of GLICs in terms of who they now identify as GLICs. This was something we discussed at length and we decided to go with 
the government's definition. So here, who are these GLICs? Minister of Finance Incorporated is a holding company created in the immediate post-colonial period to hold the assets taken over by the government, especially from the departing colonial government. It was always a huge enterprise. But this enterprise, Minister of Finance Incorporated, was always a company that we knew very little about. They have not exposed enough information on MOF Inc. That was what the book was about. But we found that the most important institutions really was not MOF Inc. The most important institutions are the statutory, are the uh, sovereign wealth funds like Kazana. Kazana is very important. A lot of money was invested in Kazana to play the role of the sovereign wealth fund, to nurture new industries, new sectors in the economy. The second one is of course the EPF. I don't need to go into what the EPF is all about. The EPF is a savings fund which is very important, which also has acquired a lot of wealth in the corporate sector. We have PNB from one national behalf, another form of saving. And it's emerged as a major owner of corporate wealth in this economy. And then we have another savings institution, KWAP. KWAP is the pension fund for uh, civil servants. And we have Tabong Haji. Tabong Haji, I don't need to tell you what Tabong Haji is. It was a fund that was created to help poor people do the Hajj, but it has become a business group in its own right. It functions differently from the other institutions. It's a business group. And we have uh, finally, the last one is LTAT. Uh, LTAT is the Lambaga Tabong Angkatan Tetra. It's also a pension fund for members of uh, the armed forces, but it too owns companies which functions as a business group. So while we have seven GLICs, the way they function is very different. That's the point we must understand. These differences are very important in terms of what role do they play in the economy. Now here, what happened was, uh, particularly under Najib, Najib, when he first came to power, he, he spoke about this GLIC world. He said, remember this, Najib came to power in the post-global financial crisis period. The economy was in serious recession. And he started advocating uh, policies such as privatization, very neoliberal type policies, privatization. The government, as he said, has no business being in business, the mantra of neoliberals like Margaret Thatcher. And he said, I am going to get rid of all these companies. What was he talking about? He was talking about these companies, these seven GLICs and the huge enterprises that they had control of. Subsequently, he changed his mind. He changed his mind because if you look at the Pamandu annual reports, the first report talks a lot about privatization. The second report, privatization is reduced to a footnote. Why? Because Najib began to realize as prime minister and mind you, minister of finance, he controlled an enormous segment of the corporate sector, a huge range of different types of institutions, not just the GLICs, but the GLICs in turn controlled statutory bodies, foundations, holding companies, development financial institutions, and then he subsequently indulged them in a lot of scandals. As you know, the Felda scandal, the Mara scandal, and of course, the 1MDB scandal. This is what can go wrong when you have a GLC world, which is so huge. And why do we need so many companies, GLCs? Why do we need so many companies? What we do need are the statutory bodies. What we do need are the DFIs, the Development Financial Institutions. What we do need are institutions like Kazana, EPF, PNB. And when we talk about privatization, what are we talking about here? If you want to get rid of 90% uh, of these companies, most of them are loss-making companies anyway, and they are just tools for patronage, I'll say, go ahead, get rid of them, trim it down. But there are some institutions you cannot touch because they play a very important role in the economy and you cannot put it in the hands of the private sector. Mahate knew of this world, he helped create it. And in the run-up to the election, he spoke of it and he called it the monster. It had evolved into a huge world in which he described as a monster, which had, was deeply mired in corruption and patronage. And that's why today when we talk about government intervention, when we talk about GLCs generally across the board, everyone says it's a bad thing. And the mantra is just privatize it and get the government out of business because Malaysians are fed up with the nonsense that is going on in this GLC world. That's why this Pamantau thing, which IDS is doing is very good. We can keep and watch on this world to make sure that this world, which still remains very much intact, is being employed properly. Here, this is the point that Ken Ming said. 
when we talk about GLCs, what exactly are we talking about? And here I've given you all a breakdown. When we talk about government institutions, GLC, GLCs, we are talking about many different types of institutions. We are talking about the GLICs, which I've already explained. Statutory bodies, statutory bodies are institutions like MARA, TALDA, Petronas, uh, the Iskanda Regional Development Authority. They also include oversight bodies like Bank Nagara. They also include uh, regional bodies that were created to eradicate poverty and to bring about rural development. Keda, Kaseda, Katanga, Kajora, very important institutions which have got their tentacles right into the rural areas created during Razak's time. And they have a very important institutions for bringing about uh, the development of rural industries and for helping to eradicate poverty or to reduce poverty in, in rural areas. Very important institutions. They are no longer playing that role because they are now doing many things. They have forgotten what their role is. And look at how all this mix, mixing of institutions and how the roles that they play. So when we talk about reforms, what exactly are we talking about? I would focus on these things statutory bodies, get them to do what they were supposed to do. Utilize them the way they were utilized when they were first formed in the 1970s, when they played a very effective role in solving social inequities. That is what we need to get back to. Mara, look at what Mara, look at how Mara has been abused. Is Mara really playing the role that it used to play? And then we have foundations. I have no idea why they need foundations. They need foundations to hold these enterprises, really? Why? Why can't they find other ways where these foundations are also in the public eye and we can hold them accountable? And what of the development financial institutions? Who are these DFIs? They are SME Bank, Export Import Bank, Agro Bank. Why are they not using these institutions far more effectively in uh, the reforms that are required now of the economy, especially in the post-crisis period? and special purpose vehicles, we have a lot of them. I, I want to move on quickly now. That's the GLC world. But do you know that ministries themselves, now we are breaking this down. I'm kicking you all now into the GLC world in its complexity. Do you know that this is in Najib's time, but he had 25 ministries and most of these ministries own companies. Why should ministries own companies? And the big four are the Prime Minister's Department, the Finance Ministry, the Ministry of Rural and Regional Development, and the Ministry of Science and Technology. Interestingly, Ministry of Science and Technology. Prime Minister's Department and Finance Department are the biggest. A lot of funding was channeled to the Prime Minister's Department, as you know, during Najib's time. And he controlled also the Ministry of Finance. How can the Prime Minister be also the exchequer? But it was important for him to control the Ministry of Finance because then he controlled, as I showed you all earlier, he had huge influence in the corporate sector. Who started all this? Mahate. Mahate was the one who decided the prime minister can also be the minister of finance. Abdullah continued it and Najib maintained it. Things only changed when Pakatan came to power because there was a lot of discussion about delinking. The prime minister cannot be linked to the minister of finance by serving in both capacities. The Ministry of Rural and Regional Development. I put that as a big four. Why? Because the Ministry of Rural and Regional Development, as I mentioned earlier, has its tentacles into rural areas. If you look at the gerrymandering and malapportionment of seats, if you want to win the elections, you need to control the rural constituencies. And here I'm talking about Sabah and Sarawak too, as well as the Malay Heartland states. Interestingly enough, the underdeveloped states, the poorer states, are also the states where you find the Ministry of Rural and Regional Development. And the institutions which are there are mobilized by the minister to control to ensure electoral support. So here now you can see how the GLCs are being used to by powerful politicians to also garner support. The Ministry of Science and Technology became very important because uh, we were moving, we are becoming a highly industrialized nation. We had to focus a lot more attention on science and technology. And interestingly enough, the government created a lot of GLCs to serve the role of helping nurture companies in the technology sector. The volume of uh, GLCs, the number of GLCs involved in the tech sector is very small. The government is never interested in really going into that, although that's where they should have gone into. 
Instead, they created the Minister of Science and Technology, and they said it will play a helping role to nurture companies in the sector. But there are no rents to be given out in this sector. And the volume of corruption in the Mosty was actually quite low. The number of politicians who were holding directorships in most Mosty related companies, minimal. We found only one, in fact. While the number of politicians who were involved in GLCs or statutory bodies in the Ministry of Rural Development was huge. The Ministry of Rural Development is also important because they control statutory bodies. I want to stress that. Whoever is in government, this is an important ministry because if you count, control the statutory bodies, you can control rural constituencies. You can channel concessions there to muster your support in rural constituencies. So pay attention to who is the Minister of Rural Development. Currently, the, the Minister of Rural Development is from Amno. Previously, it was a Basatu minister. So as you can see, the party in power will ensure that the minister in charge of this ministry is always from their party. The prime minister will always ensure it's from their party. When uh, Pakatas in, Pakatan was in power, the Minister of Rural Development was Rina Harut from Basatu. And when Najib was in power, the Minister of Rural Development was none other than our current Prime Minister, Ismail Sabri. Ismail Sabri, as you know, was a Najib protege, very closely aligned with Najib. And prior to that, it was uh, Shafi Abdal. Shafi Abdal and Najib were very close. They were very close. And then they fell out. And then, Mahath uh, then Najib brought in Ismail Sabri to head Ministry of Rural Development. You see the point here? You see how the GLCs are very important for political purposes? Now I'm saying this to you all so that you understand the significance of the GLC world. Very few people understand this role of the GLCs in the political arena. They focus more on the economic arena. And even in the economic arena, we have so little information on this. Now here, I'm giving you an indication. This is very important. I told you the problem with the GLCs or the institutions which fall under this wide, widely used term GLCs is that they do many things. As you can see, the Ministry of Finance, look at what the Ministry of Finance has. They've got GLCs doing economic related matters, socially related matters, regional development, regulatory matters, investment matters. They're doing everything. And I'm not, I have not included here Minister, Prime Minister's Department. If you look at Prime Minister's Department, it's even worse. They're involved in so many, doing so many different things. Why is this important? They control the economy. They control socially oriented institutions. They control regional development. You can see it all here happening simultaneously. Look at regional development. In terms of regional development, also you can see land development, regional development, land distribution, even education, Mara. The number of things that these so-called GLCs do, the varied things that they do. And Ministry of Science and Technology, completely different world. Financing industries, R&D, technological development. We have to be very clear. That's why the Pakupo is interesting. Clarity of purpose has to be clear when we do the reform. Now, I want to move on to the state level. All our focus has been on federal level GLCs. But do you know that every state government also controls GLCs of different sorts? Here I'm giving you a diagram of Johor controlled by AMNO before, controlled by AMNO. And you can see here, there's a huge GLC world here in Johor. This is Selangor controlled by PKR. You can see here again, the role of Menteri Basa Incorporated MBI recently mired in this controversy on the Palalangat forestry land. The powerful role of MBI. If at the federal level, we have MOF Inc. At the state level, we have MBI. And look at also the politicians who are appointed as directors for this GLCs. And then we have here, here we have PAS, Planta, a similar structure. Here, what well, the interesting thing about, sub, about Selengo is at least there's some very productive things going on there, sale too in Johor by, if they, by these state governments. But in Klantan, we didn't see. In fact, the GLC world was just used as a world to make GLC appointments as a means to give them a stipend, to give politicians a stipend. It was completely unnecessary. So I've now shown you the federal level GLCs. I've now given you an insight into state level GLCs. Here too, at the state level, when we talk about GLCs, what are we talking about? We're talking about state investment arms. I'm break, giving you the breakdown, the definitional issue. 
the breakdown is very important. The SEDCs, the SADCs, those involved in agriculture, the State Education Foundations, the State Islamic Council. And I've listed on the right again, all the different types of institutions. All these are called collectively GLCs. But as you can see here also, they do very different things. So if we are to talk about GLC reforms, we have to talk about it at the federal level and we have to do one also at the state level. And each state, as I just showed you, I showed you, Par I showed you uh, Klantan, I showed you Selengo, and I showed you Johor, they do things differently. So when we talk about reforms, what exactly are the reforms that we are talking about? We have to do a breakdown, even at the state level, to see how they, how they function, and the reforms will be particular to each state. Now, I've dealt with the state government and the federal government. I want to go to the next stage, publicly listed firms. Now, Ken Ming drew some attention to this, publicly listed firms. Now, here, as you can see, in red, these are GLCs. Look at how powerful the GLCs are, the listed GLCs. If you look at the top 10 companies in the country, this was in 2018, eight of them, eight of them are GLCs. There was uh, some estimation of the value of these assets controlled by the government under the so-called GLC world. And according to one estimation, it was about 1.7 trillion ringgit in terms of assets. 1.7 trillion. I don't think that is a, to my mind, accurate, not even a fair representation based on what we've looked at is probably far more than that. But just look at the publicly listed companies. And as pointed out earlier too, we have here a couple of banks. We have May Bank there, we have CIMB Bank there. We, we see them in competition with each other. So CIMB in competition with May Bank, both controlled by the government, but controlled by different GLICs. Both also have become uh, regional players. The thing about these GLIs, GLCs is that they think of themselves as privately run, privately owned firms. They think of them as in like a typical neoliberal type enterprise go in, compete, make profits, and give back to your shareholders the dividends. They function in a way in which they're not, I would argue, necessarily very socially oriented. Look at Saim Dhabi and some of the allegations against Saim Dhabi in terms of how it treats its workers. Look at Saim Dhabi and some of the allegations that were made against Saim Dhabi in terms of violation of the environment, exploitation of the environment. These are things that you say about multinational companies which are privately owned. We would expect better of our GLCs controlled by the government, the government would be a lot more careful about such things. Uh, paying fair wages, protecting the environment. Is that the case? That is not the case at all. So here, there's something again to talk about. When we talk about publicly listed firms, the kind of reforms that we have to talk about will also again be different. Again, like I said, the reforms depend on who we are talking about. That's why the, com the complexity of reforms that are required. Forms of intervention. Now I'm just talking about publicly listed firms. The forms of intervention also vary. When we looked at the publicly listed firms from our tabulation, seven of, seven of them can be classified as GLCs in the sense that majority ownership. But 127 companies, the government has substantial shareholding, which means the government can, as a shareholder, dictate how it functions. And then we also have joint ownership, multiple institutions. If you pull them together, there's a lot of these GLC, GLICs in, who have ownership of publicly listed companies, equity. We also have companies or GLCs or, or investment type institutions from the state level, which own uh, equity, in, equity in publicly listed firms. So this is a really complex world that we are talking about in the way in which the government intervenes. And when they intervene, intervene for what purpose? There's no clarity here too. Why exactly do they own the shares in these companies? So there's again uh, further necessity to look at what is happening here, to map out what is going on here, and then we can talk about how to clean up the system. I want to go on to the next point. This is the point which uh, I'm rather concerned about. One of the new phenomena that occurred was the rise of China and the use of their state-owned enterprises to become key players in the region, in the globe, uh, global economy, in fact. Now, the key proponent of this of late is Xi Jinping when he came to power in 2013. Of course, prior to this, uh, China had the go out policy that was already going on, but Xi Jinping came out with a particularly important plan called the BRI, the Belt Road Initiative. This is a very interesting uh, year, 2013. In 2013, when Xi Jinping came to power, not long later, he introduces BRI. 
In 2013, Najib Razak lost badly in the general election. If you look at the 10th Malaysia plan, the first plan that Najib introduced, uh, it was in response to the global financial crisis. And it was also in response to the Barisan National having done badly in the 2008 general election, which led to Abdullah standing down. When Najib took over, the rhetoric changed. He talked about being a more inclusive government. You will well remember his motto, One Malaysia. He talked about privatization. He said, stop affirmative action. He said all these things which uh, were quite surprising actually, but also a response to what was happening in the economy as well as a reaction to the disciplining that he got from the electorate or the party, uh, Barisan National Court from the electorate. And he came up with a whole slew of different plans, the government transformation plan, the economic transformation plan, the new economic model, apart from the 10 Malaysia plan. But he also began to backtrack. In 2013, 2000 and, uh, this was in 2009. In 2013, he went to a general election. He said, vote for me is a vote, a vote for me is a vote for my policies. You will remember the 2013 election was all about Najib and they voted against him. They voted against his policies. So what did Najib do then? He changed the 11th Malaysia plan, then shifted to a focus on not one Malaysia anymore, but on the introduction of the Bumiputra economic empowerment policy the BEE policy. I'm waiting to read the 12 Malaysia plan to see the assessment of the 11th Malaysia plan and the BEE policy. And when Najib introduced the Bumiputra economic empowerment policy, he also said, I'm going to use the GLCs to implement the BEE. I'm saying this to you so you all know very well uh, how the GLCs fit into uh, public policies and the political agenda of our politicians. When he did that, he knew he was going to drive away private investments, domestic investments. He was bringing about the return of affirmative action, which he admitted in 2009 was not drawing investments from the private sector. People feared uh, affirmative action because it led to the expropriation of their wealth, non Bumiputras in particular. were worried, worried, very worried about this. But Najib, in 2013, having lost badly, he reacted. The reaction was captured in the headlines in Utusan, Malaysia. Upper Lagi China Mao. Remember that headline? And subsequently, the public policy, the BEE policy. Now, how do you deal with the loss of domestic investments? And there comes Xi Jinping saying, I have BRI and I'm willing to move in and give you these investments. Two strong men in two powerful parties, authoritarian leaders get together and they start negotiating deals. And Najib encouraged FDI from China. And he saw the consequences of that. So important for us today is the new phenomenon, state-state ties, SOEs working with GLCs, the state business relations, the form in which they take have now uh, become even more complex. We're talking about a very complex form of government business ties that have emerged in the more modern era. We are talking now about not public, public, not public private partnerships, but public public partnerships. Here, where do we go from here? This is where now we come to today. This is the point. We don't have enough information. I was asking Ken Ming if you can get more data on investments from different countries. I would like to look at the investment flows from China. I also know that uh, investments foreign investors have been leaving, the, leaving this country and going to other countries of late. And uh, as you know, the 12th Malaysia plan gave us the recent breakdown in equity ownership patterns. Foreign ownership of our economy is quite high, approaching 45%, could well soon be 50%. What are the implications of all this? And now we have the situation of public-public cooperation, public-public partnerships, SOEs working with GLCs. How does all this work? So here, this is why the government ecosystem, this Pamantau plan that, that IDS is proposing is very important. It has to go beyond just looking at who are the directors. It has to look at this government ecosystem and the governance patterns, the public governance pattern. We have to map out this GLC framework. We just don't know what it looks like anymore. It's just so huge. I only captured or showed you the tip of the iceberg. What I also showed you is enormous concentration of power in the office of the executive, not only at the, in the federal level, but also at the state level. 
and look at what this leads to. It informs economic decision-making, policy directions, the way incentives are distributed. If they do it properly, you get development, if transparent. If you do it badly, if it's predatory in nature, you get rent seeking, corruption, selective patronage. It now appears that we're seeing more of the latter. We are not seeing really good development outcomes. If they were, why is it that among the poorer states are still the Malay Heartland states where a lot of attention was focused on those states, Sabah, Sarawak, Klantan, Kedah, Trunganu. A lot of attention was focused through the statutory bodies on these states. They were the more underdeveloped states of the, of the country. Why are they still so underdeveloped? GLC concentration, I talked about this point. I'm really worried about these points. Where are the GLCs concentrated? In which ministries? Who has control? Which ministers are the most powerful in terms of controlling the GLCs? Are they willing to relinquish control? These are things we need to look at and be clear, especially if you want to promote transparent, transparent and accountable government, governance. Forms of intervention. There are a variety, I showed you already, a variety of ways in which the government intervenes in the economy. We want progressive forms of intervention. That is what we are calling for. Transparent, accountable, progressive, based on redistribution, look to solving inequalities in the country, regional inequalities, wealth and income disparities, moving into sectors that need help, the high-tech sector, the digital economy. We need help in uh, the agriculture sector, bringing about new technology in agriculture to ensure high uh, volume of food production. We know we have a food security problem. And the number of companies involved in SMEs in agriculture sector is very small. And finally, the post-pandemic period. We come back to the Pukuko plan. I welcome the Pukuko plan. As I said, this is a, an attempt now to recognize they got to do something with this world. The idea of crowding in is interesting because 98% of the corporate sector SMEs, they do need help, particularly now. They do need help. They have also introduced the digital economic blueprint. They have said the digital economy blueprint will also be, they will employ the GLCs, the ecosystem to help implement the digital economy blueprint, particularly to help the SMEs. We've been talking about the rise of the gig economy. We talk about e-marketing. Most of our SMEs are not really using these kinds of technology that is required for them to work well in the modern economy, in the new post-pandemic period. What are the proposed solutions for SMEs to do this? I'd like to close with my recommendations because the, here we talked about reforms. That is the reforms. Now, I am not going to come here and say to you, here are these reforms because I told you how complex the world is. Ken Ming pointed it out and I concur with him on this. Who exactly are we talking about when we say GLCs? If you come out with one standard model of reforms, you're not going to address the problems at all. You need a whole range of uh, reform recommendations, depending on who we are talking about. So that, where do we start with? We start with mapping out the GLC ecosystem. We cannot stop only at the GLIC level. We need to get into a proper uh, uh, overview, a proper research onto what this ecosystem looks like. I can tell you now that when we did the research, even members of the Ministry of Finance, even gov senior government officials told us they have no clue how many GLCs there are in this country. And they meant also, it, it included not just companies, foundations, SEDCs, they, they had no clue. If even people in government have no clue how many GLCs there are broadly defined, what are we talking about in terms of reforms? There's still so much research that needs to be done. And the reforms vary at the federal level, they vary at the state level. And at the state level, they vary also among the 13 state governments. So please, I, I would suggest this strongly, when we talk about reforms, don't come with one catch-all reform. It's not going to work. There's a lot of discussion about using the IMF or OECD reforms. They don't work in our context. We cannot be so simplistic and say, OECD reforms, they said we must do it. It's okay, we do this. It may work to a certain level too, to a small number of companies, but they do not deal with this problem of reform of the GLC ecosystem. And what of political control of GLCs? We saw that very clearly under Mohiri. Ken Ming is here. Ken Ming will also agree. 
he will not uh, dispute this. Although in the Pakatan Manifesto, they said GLC will not, politicians will not be appointed as directors of GLCs. That is true, but they were appointed as directors of statutory bodies. I feel that we must pay attention to this too. Statutory bodies, there may be some reasons why politicians should sit in statutory bodies. I will not dispute that. But at the same time, I would like to exercise caution. You saw how statutory bodies can be tools for mustering political support. So let's put that also on the table for discussion. Institutional autonomy. How do we provide autonomy to these worlds? We know now they have no choice. They have to play a big role in the economy. We know that. We can't turn to the private sector, especially now with their dire straits post-pandemic period. They need government help. So if the GLCs broadly defined are involved in this economy, both in terms of helping the economy as well as oversight into uh, set, uh, regulatory bodies too, where is the autonomy here for these oversight bodies? If you look at the literature, when we have countries with a huge uh, GLC system or SOE system, they talk about the need for a coordinating institution. You can have a centralized model or decentralized model, but they all talk about a coordinating institution. The coordinating institution is that institution that knows the GLC world very well, connects the dots, make sure that they move in the correct direction to implement policies well. And then the one that we talk about a lot, internal managerial reforms, bringing in professionals, let the professionals run the GLCs. You can bring in the professionals, but if the professionals are subservient to the politicians who appointed them, they are not, don't expect any major changes. So this professionalization of the GL of the management of the GLCs, like as if it's going to solve all problems, perish the thought. It's not going to happen unless they are truly independent. Professional managers with autonomy. I close on this point. There's been no political will for these reforms. Even when Pakatan took over, I thought if Mahate calling it the GLC monster, I thought he would move ahead with the reforms. Mahate didn't. Mahate probably didn't because he recognized that the GLC will could be used as a political tool to consolidate his position, especially the position of the SAPU. Controlling key institutions like the Ministry of Rural Development and the statutory bodies. These are the issues that we need to think about when we talk about reforms. It's not just purely economic reforms or managerial reforms. There are also political reforms that we need to think about when we talk about how to clean up this GLC world. Okay, I'm done, Shukri. Back to you. All right, thank you then. Um, I am. Um, thank you for building up uh, more uh, heat in the discussion today. Um, now let's let's go very quickly onto the website. Um, our colleague uh, Iskanda will walk through on the pantalkwasa.com and how that we can actually understand better on this website. Go on, Iskanda. Thank you, Zokri. And <clears throat> sorry, uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Ali Iskanda, and I'm excited to share and give a brief walkthrough with everyone and what we at ITS have been working on for the past eight months. But uh, if you would like to go at it at your own pace, you can click it on uh, click on the link in the chat box, or by going to padakwasa.com. Right now, let's get started. All right. I'm assuming everybody can uh, see this. So if you don't, if you if there is a problem, please let me know. If you'd like to go, uh, sorry, uh, Pantakwasa aims to keep track of political appointments that happens in federal statute bodies, bodies in Malaysia with the data we collect. We publish written articles or of findings or explanations in a section that we dub as highlights right here. We visualize the collected data into something that is easy for everyone to get the picture of political appointments in Malaysia. Here is, here is a sample of what we found that shows the size of political appointments in three administra administrations. And you can actually just play around with this as well. In, underneath here is a brief explanation of the project, along with crafted frequently asked questions based on what we often hear about this project as we are working on it. We plan to keep the website up to date, and we look forward to receiving any contribution to ensure the accuracy of our data. 
insights are crafted are crafted with an audience in mind. Thus far, we have put up some explainers to help give everyone a brief idea on a topic before diving into the visualization. We are planning to release more in-depth insight very soon, so please be on the lookout for that. The visualization is the crowning jewel of our efforts. We have three visualizations ready and they each serve different functions. I'll only briefly go through one of them, but encourage everyone to explore them at your own time. Dub links. This visualization gives a good picture of political appointment links. Our data are separated by eras, meaning who was the reigning PM. And they're totally interactive. You can click on a portrait and you can go straight to whatever page they link to. The persons up here, ministries, or statutory bodies. These are the backbone of our, of our website and it all links to one another. <clears throat> so please explore it at your own, at your heart's content. And that concludes the end of my walkthrough. Thank you everyone for joining me through it. I hope this website is a useful tool for everyone here to monitor political appointments in FSBs and JLCs. Back to you, Zofri. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Iskandar, uh, for walking us through on the website. Uh, thank you to all listeners. We've got tons of questions ranging from your all of your interests. So uh, let's try with that one by one. I shall uh, try to address all of the questions uh, being raised in the chat box. Now, I, I think the first questions uh, will go from, from our FB page. Uh, now, uh, I think this is uh, it could apply to both uh, Prof and Doctor. Now, um, some of us see that we do not have any issues on um, political appointments in GLCs, as long as they are transparent and, and understand and practices good governance. Um, but I think from both of your presentations that you're trying to establish the point that um, even so, it will open up the risk uh, towards not having transparency and good governance, no matter how good or how, how independent and neutral the, the appointment is. So uh, again, do you think that we should have a clear cut, no political appointment, or should we have like a very strict rules and observations and political appointment to this GLCs? Let, let's start from there. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass to uh, Prof, and then I'll, I'll go to uh, Dr. Ong. Prof. Oh, thank you. I don't, like I said, uh, when we talk about the GLCs, we are talking about a whole range of institutions, very different institutions. So to say a catch-all phrase, no politicians as directors of GLCs, what exactly do we mean? Uh, they're talking basically about those which are classified as companies under the Companies Act, those which are publicly listed. For that, I'll say yes. I don't see any need for that. I am willing to enter into a debate and to consider the need for politicians in certain institutions, like say the statutory bodies, given the role that they play to ensure that the statutory bodies do 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 what they are supposed to do as per public policies that were 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 recommended by the politicians in their manifesto. That I will be clear. When it comes to sovereign wealth funds like Kazana, should the prime minister be the chairman of Kazana? I would say no. Pe many people will disagree with me. But I would say no because experience has shown us that when the prime minister sits as the chairman of Kazana, the directors tend to be subservient to the prime minister. Uh, does the prime minister really need to sit as the chairman of Kazana, for that matter, to the finance minister. I would like to do a deeper analysis of how things panned out in the past and then decide. Uh, when it comes to PNB, Tabung Haji, should they be there? Again, I would say no. Tabung Haji, there's no need. The pension funds like LTAT, KWAP, uh, Yes, I can understand if you tell me there's a need for them to keep an oversight there, but that is problematic. If they are appointed, we must be very clear what their roles are. Should they be paid a stipend? I would question that too. Why should they be paid a stipend for their role which they are sitting in in terms of their oversight 
role there. So that's my response. It depends on what institution that we're talking about. All right, thank you. YB Doctor? Yeah, thanks for the question. Very relevant one. Um, I would agree with uh, Terence in terms of uh, his proposal or his question on why the PM should be the head of Kazana or the chairman of Kazana. Um, I think if we look at other uh, GLICs uh, such as EPF, uh, the, the chairman is not the prime minister. right? So even though Kazana, of course, is 100% uh, owned by the Malaysian uh, government, I think uh, because of the duty or, or the, the, the rather the, the direction or the priorities of uh, institutional investors such as Kazana, uh, I, I think it's probably not necessary for a person of the prime minister's stature to uh, sit as the chairman. Uh, you know, there may be other conflicting uh, uh, priorities or agendas that we have. So uh, better to actually appoint somebody uh, who maybe has a, a greater experience in uh, investing in uh, in uh, maybe uh, you know somebody with a certain amount of corporate uh, experience and uh, also respect. Uh, I think where uh, I, uh, I would uh, want to push the envelope further in terms of discussion uh, would be the point about appointing uh, politicians onto stat boards. And I can see the, the both pros and cons. Uh, of course, the cons is similar to what Terence has been uh, saying, and I think many people have not been happy with the fact that when there was a change in government, all those backbencher MPs who did not uh, you know, get any cabinet positions were given some sort of GLC appointment, uh, mostly as, uh, as uh, directors, or mostly as chairman, or some high-level position. Uh, and it's very easy to see that uh, this, uh, to interpret this as a way to sort of like uh, uh, buy them off, pay them off, so to speak. Um, I, I agree with that assertion. Uh, so, for example, when I was the director of uh, uh, PTPTN, I actually told the chairman I did not want to take any stipend. I did not want to take any allowance. Uh, but he rejected my offer because if I was the one doing that, then I may be forced to, uh, you know, he may be forced to ask the other directors to do the same. All right. So, uh, you know, I, I still continue to take a small allowance. Uh, but I did not take uh, the bonus that was given to directors. I was quite surprised to learn this as well. You know, it's like, what did I do as director to deserve a bonus? No, you know, is, this is, if there's any bonus, it should be given to the staff, you know, uh, not, not the directors. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, all these things require more disclosure. Uh, all these things, I think, are not disclosed uh, in the financial returns of these uh, statutory bodies. Uh, and I think that there could be more oversight uh, in terms of these kinds of financial expenditures uh, on the part of these uh, statutory bodies. Because uh, unlike um, publicly listed companies that are, that are compelled to uh, state what the uh, allowances, the monthly allowances and stipends given to their directors, this is not the case with the, uh, the, the Ministry of uh, Financing companies. Uh, or with the statutory bodies. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I would say that there may be uh, some, some need or some um, uh, positive aspects of appointing uh, members of parliament uh, you know, from both sides of the aisle uh, onto different statutory bodies. Uh, and this may be a way in which we can give experience uh, to different members of parliament uh, from a policy perspective uh, so that as and when, if let's say they have an opportunity to be deputy minister or minister, they would at least be more exposed to the, 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 the regulatory practices, the kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, governing, governance questions that uh, will arise among these different statutory bodies. Right? So this is an experience which I think, uh, if let's say we can make the argument that uh, both sides of the political uh, divide, they can nominate their own MPs uh, to be uh, nominated as directors uh, of different institutions and then make, make an argument for that. So, for example, oh, Fami Fadil, he's the MP for Lumba Pantai. Should be he, shouldn't he be made a director into uh, UM, where his constituency lies? Uh, I'm the member of parliament for Bangi. Should I not be made uh, as part of the Lembaga uh, Pengara in UKM so that I can also have some, some sort of say and input into the policies of an institution in my own area? Right, uh, and if let's say the case may be, we can forego our stipends, we can forego our financial uh, allowances and stuff like that, so that people can see that we are in it because we want to serve the people. Right? Yeah, you know, we 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 have we had uh, MPs that are uh, you know, nominated as chairman of SEDA, Sustainable Energy Development Authority of SPAN, uh, that governs the, the 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 water policies in Malaysia. 
you know, and I, I would argue that the, both of the individuals that were appointed to these positions uh, had uh, good uh, backgrounds. One is the lawyer, uh, you know, Wong Kar Wo. The other one is uh, Charles Santiago with a long history of advocacy on uh, water equity and, and other uh, related issues. So I think, you know, they have the experience and this may be a useful experience for them to uh, use along the way, you know, to, to uh, uh, build up their own experience as well as to build up the the credibility of the institutions of which they, they are chairman of, right? So uh, I think, uh, you know, much more discussion needs to be had on this particular area, which is why from the start, I advocated for definitional difference. Let's separate out these uh, categories into, uh, you know, publicly listed companies, into statutory bodies, uh, you know, uh, into, uh, you know, uh, privately owned companies by the Ministry of Finance or even some of the other ministries that have their own company, company limited by guarantees. And then perhaps as a suggestion to ideas uh, and also Terence, perhaps do case studies on some of these companies so that more light can be, uh, you know, sh shown upon uh, the practices and the track record of these uh, different categories of uh, institutions. All right, thank you. Um, now, moving on to the next question. Uh, again, I'll, I'll go from the Facebook-based questions. Um, I think it's a general question, but I think that it's also important for us to actually be clear on this. Now, I, I think in the future, how do we see the involvement of, of government in, in companies, especially in GLICs or, or GLCs? Uh, do we see that the government should be a minimalist in terms of intervening or in terms of constructing these companies? Or do we think that the government should have more involvement, but this involvement has to be really uh, cleared out, has to be really regulated so that there will not be any abuse of power. I think uh, I think the layman out there would like to know that should we have a very clear separation government and companies where government just make policies and these companies will just react according to the policies made or there should be an intertwine uh, of government and these companies so that our economy will be better. I'll pose this question to both of you. Uh, perhaps any one of you would like to start? Uh, uh, maybe I'll start. Uh, I, I think, uh, again, we need to look at the types of companies that you're talking about here. Uh, for the publicly listed companies, uh, I think that uh, there does not need to be any uh, government golden share or, or government uh, substantive government ownership uh, from a control standpoint. Because I think uh, the less there, there is political interference, uh, the, the more accountable these uh, companies can be to their uh, board of directors, to their chairman, uh, and also ultimately to their shareholders. Uh, but the question then becomes, is it possible for the government to be sort of like a dormant uh, shareholder uh, in this uh, in these GLCs, uh, so that you know they are there like PNB merely to collect the dividends from uh, Maybank, right? Uh, you know because they also need to have share ownership. Uh, you know some of these clicks so that they can uh, pour some of these dividends back into their their fund holders, right? So uh, I think uh, you know the the ownership there from uh, from a uh, uh, regulatory standpoint is not necessary. But it may be necessary for, for other purposes, uh, such as, uh, you know, I need to put the money somewhere. Let's say I'm a BPF or I'm a, I'm QA or I'm a, I'm a I'm PNB, right? So I think that, that needs to be uh, discussed. And as far as I know, I have not seen many concrete examples of direct uh, government interference into policies of uh, these uh, uh, GLCs. So for example, uh, you know, there has been pressure put forth by, by uh, you know, some people in the opposition, including my secretary general, uh, you know, Lim Guan Eng, on asking uh, the banks to waive their, their the interest, uh, you know, uh, charges uh, on the moratorium, loan moratorium payments. Uh, and I think Bank Nagar, this uh, Ministry of Finance has come out to say, look, we're going to try to apply this uh, at the B50 level, uh, you know, uh, and Bank Negara actually came out with a statement to say that, look, you know, there needs to be different considerations when applying this principle. Uh, and I think uh, there is no uh, sort of like very uh, hard directive coming from MOF to say that all of you banks have to comply or else, right? It's more of like a persuasive kind of strategy. So I think uh, there is enough, uh, I think, corporate governance kind of uh, uh, checks and balances uh, in terms of uh, government interference of these, in these public listed companies. However, this does not mean that these public listed companies are free from making mistakes. 
uh, and being less than accountable uh, because of their own in internal arrangements. So I, I pointed to the fact that uh, Saim Dhabi uh, lost billions of ringgit uh, oil and gas appoint, uh, investments over the past, uh, you know, I think uh, 10 years or so. Uh, was there any accountability in terms of asking some of the directors to step down uh, or to be, to, to, to be accountable for, for those losses? I don't think so. So, you know, this is where I think we need to have uh, uh, important uh, governance oversights coming from Bursa, uh, coming from MOF, uh, so that you know, there can be better transparency proce procedures and process within these uh, GLCs, regardless of whether there's political appointees. Okay. Now, my response to this is that I would like to come back to what the Kuko itself pointed out, clarity of purpose. What is that government when, what is, why is the government <coughs> intervening, <coughs> intervening in a company? What is a sp specific focus? I'm saying this also because uh, we are talking about different kinds of institutions. But the discussion here, I would say, is more towards companies, particularly publicly listed companies. Let's start with that. If you look at publicly listed companies too, uh, what I would look at is strategic sectors. Some are strategic sectors, utilities, for example, even banking, I would consider a strategic sector. Here, I think government involvement is uh, fundamental. You want to publicly list, list it, fine. There's co-ownership with the public, okay. But there must also be a greater disclosure, appointment of directors and how they manage it. So we need to be very clear. What do we define as strategic sectors? If these are strategic sectors, yes, the government has to go in. Non-strategic sectors, for example, construction. To my mind, that's not strategic, but that's where you find a lot of involvement by GLC. What are the GLCs doing in the construction sector? Some people may say, no, it is strategic because you can keep the price of housing, for example, lower. But do you need to be a publicly listed company to provide housing, affordable housing to, to Malaysians? So we need to go sector by sector. I don't want to give blanket statements here. I would like to do a breakdown of these sectors, and I will say in certain sectors, we need to do it. Second. If you look at companies which are also classified as DLCs, for example, the GLICs, Kazana. Kazana has a role to play in intervening in the economy. I said that they have a development purpose here, a developmental purpose here, trying to develop key sectors of the economy. So, for example, I mentioned earlier Mosti, the Ministry of Science and Technology. Mosti set up a number of companies. And what did they do that for? They, do, they did that to help promote R&D. They did that to help bring about technological development. They did that to finance industries. There's a partnership here with other companies to bring them in, create supply chains uh, with these SMEs to help to nurture these companies. Is that good? I would say, yes, it's very good. So but there's a specific focus here. We know why they're entering into a particular sector. And in some sectors, you really do need government intervention, especially those in the high-tech sector, those which are capital intensive, those, as I said, which are strategic. We cannot do away with that. That's the kind of debate that we need to have. That's the mapping we need to do to decide how and to what extent the government intervenes. For other sectors, I'll leave it to the private firms. Let them, there's no need for the government to be involved there. Let the competition be with those private firms. So that's my response, uh, Zukri, to you on this point. Thank you. So we are all coming back to the mandate and the purpose of why a uh, certain organization is established. Right. Good point then. Now, um, let, let's move on to the questions that we received uh, in the Zoom room. Yep. Um, there's questions by Fikri uh, on the uh, Parliamentary Select Committee. Uh, I can see that, Dr. Ong, you're trying to type something, but again, as perhaps in the interest of all of our listeners out here, uh, would you like to to, to uh, explain that. Do you agree that the parliament would have the capacity to spearhead uh, in overseeing the process of governance and reforms of our GLCs and GLICs? Or do you think that it should not be uh, the duty of this uh, particular parliamentary select committee, uh, your point of view as an MP? You're mute, can we? Sorry, uh, I'd like to answer uh, that question and together with another question on the uh, Parliamentary Select Committee uh, on GLC appointments. Uh, and then after that, tie in with some of the questions relating to CPTPP and uh, GLC uh, reforms. Uh, 
I think that I would support the parliamentary uh, select committee uh, on GLC appointments or to put the responsibility of um, uh, asking questions about the, um, the, the, the policy governance regarding GLC appointments uh, under some of the existing uh, special committees, such as the one that I sit on, which is the finance and economy, uh, you know, parliamentary uh, special committee. Uh, but I would make a differentiation here. I don't think GLC appointments to publicly listed companies should come through a parliamentary special committees because there's a separate governance structure that uh, you know that's de 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 determined by uh, Bursa and also the the the, the internal uh, operations of some of these. Uh, public listed companies. Uh, but in terms of the overall kind of uh, policy uh, direction of MOF, uh, you know, uh, on uh, and, and a bank, uh, you know, and Bank Negara for, for financial institutions, uh, Securities Commission for, for, you know, these, uh, these kinds of policies, I think we should be able to call them up to ask them questions about the general policy direction, rather than to ask them, oh, why was this person Appointed to the board of uh, this particular public listed company, or why was this person appointed as chairman of Tanaga? You know, I I, I don't think uh, that kind of uh, that level of scrutiny uh, may be. Uh, we can ask those questions, but I, I don't think we should have uh, sort of like uh, uh, you know veto power over over these kinds of appointments uh, for publicly listed companies. But for appointment of statutory bodies, uh, I, I think this is one where uh, there can be more parliamentary oversight. Uh, I think if any politician were to be appointed as chairman of any statutory body, I think uh, this uh, you know this person should go through uh, either a special select committee or existing uh, select committees that have oversight over the, the specific area. Uh, so, for example, there's uh, there would be a special committee to look at uh, education policies. For example, that person uh, that that committee should uh, interview any political appointees who are appointed as uh, directors or as uh, chairman of any lembaga pendidikan of uh, the public uh, universities. Uh, you know, for, for other financial institutions, it comes under finance and economy and trade. Uh, you know, for, for uh, natural resources, it should be, it should be under uh, that special committee. So I, I think that needs to be much more nuanced. Uh, there cannot be sort of like a very sweeping statement. Uh, but I think we need to work hard towards uh, outlining the kind of uh, policy direction that we want to uh, hit towards, especially since we have these MOUs that have been signed by uh, the opposition as well as uh, the government. On the CPTPP, uh, I think generally speaking, uh, it would put more pressure for GLCs to try to open up, uh, even though we have certain carve-outs, but eventually we would have to open up the economy more uh, in terms of uh, government, uh, in terms of these GLC procurements. I'll stop there, I'll take a call. Shukri, we can go on to the next question if you wish. Uh, on the next question, then. Um, okay, Prof. Since since Doctor mentioned about the CPTPP, any quick observations or comment on, on from you on the CPTPP? Uh, no, not really. I'm not too keen on the. If I may say so. Uh, uh, and there's been a lot of discussion there about the role of the GLCs there too. No. Okay. Uh, I would like to focus more on what's happening internally because we need to sort out what needs to be done internally in terms of the reforms before we talk about it in terms of it in the, from a regional perspective too. But All if right, I may, okay. yeah. I would like to make one point. Since I'm, we are talking about this, uh, these appointments, one issue which I have not touched on is why is it this we are having this discussion on GLC appointments, politicians as directors. If they are being appointed as directors to have an oversight on the implementation of policies, that's fine. We can see a role. But what is the real crux of the problem is this, and I've not mentioned this at all, and I think I should do it now for the audience who's listening. The issue of political financing. We saw this also under Mohidin. And why do we have this multitude of GLCs? The GLCs were created as a mechanism where they can then distribute rents to people on the ground through the GLCs under the different institutions. That's one. People on the ground means politicians on the ground. 
selective patronage, which is linked to the abuse of the affirmative action policy, the abuse of the Bumiputra policy, where they target only party members. Second, when you're appointed as a director, you get a stipend. What happens with the stipend? To my understanding, the stipend is then channeled by these politicians into the political arena to support their political activities. And we know now that this is very rampant. This is where all the leakages come in. This is where all the patronage and corruption comes in. So that is why we've got to be very careful about the appointment of politicians as directors. We have to be very clear what their role is. And that's why the, I've mentioned the point about stipends. If they are there also, no stipends are to be given to these politicians. So I just want to put this down because today as we speak, we're having a big debate on the Political Financing Act. And one of the reasons why the Political Financing Act is important is because we must make sure the Political Financing Act also pays very close attention to the GLC board, because that's where the money is coming from. You know, a lot of money is being channeled through the GLC from the government, ostensibly during the implementation of policies, which are then channeled into the political arena for political activities. And that's why the volume of money in the political arena is stupendous. And we keep asking, where is all this money coming from? And the horror story may be, it may be coming from the public office themselves by the politicians who control government. And this happens too at the state level. So that is something also uh, we need to put on the agenda and discuss. I would like the members of the audience who are here to keep that in mind, why this role of GLCs is this important. This discussion on GLCs is so important because it's so closely linked to political financing. Right, so I mean, it's just a matter of the, the money cycle, you know, what comes in, what goes out, and it's just like encircling around uh, perhaps the same actors and the same institutions or the linked institutions altogether. Yeah. Interestingly, this was even admitted by uh, Muhyiddin and other politicians. They, 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 need, they need the money. And we asked ourselves, why do politicians need so much money? They're already well paid as MPs anyway in the state assembly, but in all the other perks that come with being an elected member of, 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 the, of uh, the assembly of parliament. So that's why this comes back to the issue of the heavy monetization of politics. It's becoming quite scandalous, the volume of money that is. Being, is swirling around, swirling around in the political arena. And now we know it's coming from through these appointments made as directors of GLCs. The second point, which I think we also need to st stress ideas, we'll have to look at it through the for one time. When the GLC appoint a director, what exactly is his role? Is he going to abuse his role as a director for political interests to get further support from a particular constituency? Is there an abuse of his power as a director in that regard too? So it's not just about the money. It's also about abuse of power that can come with these directorial appointments. All right, let's talk about SME, Prof. Prof, do you see that by reforming the, the GLCs uh, would actually help to ensure that the SME will also be uh, benefited from, from this reform? Do, can we draw a linkage between the yep. reforms as well as the SME's um, elevation? Yes, uh, in fact, that's a very important question. and That's been my primary focus also. When I looked at the GLC world, I must tell you, I was also keeping an eye on the SMEs. We have a major structural problem in this country. Uh, according to uh, the government, we have about 1.2 million companies. 98.5% of them, according to the government's definition, 98.5% of them are SMEs. Now, out of these 98.5%, out of these companies, which are classified as SMEs, 76% of them have been classified as micro. Only 21% has been classified as small, and uh, about 2% is medium. Only 2% are medium. 21% are small, and 76% are micro. Micro means five employees and less. Now, this is a major structural problem in the Malaysian economy. If they are the backbone of the economy, and the majority of them are nearly micro firms, then we have a serious structural problem. And this is where the government has to intervene to also help develop this SME sector, especially since they constitute such a huge segment of the corporate sector. How does the government go about doing it? That's why I like the idea in the Pakuko about crowding in, bringing the SMEs into the center. And that's the role of the government to nurture these kinds of enterprises. The second point, 
the, when we look at where are these uh, companies situated in, 90% of these companies are situated in services. Only about 5% of them, 5% are situated in the manufacturing sector, 4% in construction. And in agriculture, which is so important, only 1.1% of our SMEs are in agriculture. That's why also we have a food security problem too. You know. Now, if we don't have companies in agriculture, who is going to be involved in food production? Who's going to deal with this food security problem? So there are also those problems in which sectors are the SMEs in. And if SMEs or companies are not doing food production, who's going to do it? Do we turn to the GLCs as a priority sector? You have to go into agriculture in a big way. I would say yes, it's a priority sector. Food security is a priority for this country. The GLCs have the resources, the know-how. They can bring in new technologies. Vertical farming, for example, bring in the right people, access to land. You don't need that much land with vertical farming. Go into different kinds of food production. I'm not talking here about rice. I'm talking about other food products, including vegetables. So this thing about the SMEs, uh, we, it has to be brought to the center of this discussion also when we talk about GLCs. Because as I said, the role of the GLCs is also to intervene, to help nurture productive enterprises in key sectors of the economy. And given the structural problems that we have in this country today with SMEs, all the more now why the government has to intervene, and possibly through the different types of GLCs, to help nurture this SME sector, do it quickly. But Prof, now let's go back onto the uh, whole of government approach, uh, as you mentioned. Now, um, and in order to do that, we need to look at rooms of reforms uh, in order for the whole of government approach to succeed. Now, so in the ecosystem that we have currently at the moment, which area exactly that we need to reform or which area that we actually need to actually pay attention to? Is it the quantity? Is it the numbers of the GLCs, the numbers of the appointments? Or is it, as you mentioned just minutes ago, that the structure is the main problem? Or thirdly, uh, is it because of the integrity or the implementation of this weak structure of these big numbers that cause problems that needs further reforms? So. Uh, how, how, yeah, what, what should we start? What is the main priority and how do we go about from here, Prof? Now we have different, as I said, different institutions doing different things. Whole of government approach means a mapping of first, what are the key public policies? And two, how are you gonna go about implementing it? And this is where the GLCs come into helping with the implementation. For, for example, if you have uh, a policy on industrialization, digital economy blueprint let's take that concrete you want to create a uh, bring create platforms onto which companies smes can come in to become part of this digital economy who creates that platform and this is where the government can intervene and that will, here we will look to institutions like say kazana kazana is responsible for looking at key sectors which the government has identified they need to develop these are risky ventures these are capital intensive ventures and that's the role of the sovereign wealth fund go into these kinds of sectors. So the whole of government approach means also looking at how does the government use these GLCs, these different types of GLCs to implement particular public policies. Second, on the issues of say statutory bodies, the government has made it very clear, read the 12 Malaysia plan, regional disparities, for example, regional inequalities, uh, the rural urban divide. Now, if you look at regional disparities, how does the government deal with regional disparities. And this is where, again, we look at the role of key institutions that the government has control of. And I come back to the point of the statutory bodies. In the Razak administration, when the government looked at rural poverty, what did Razak do? He created the statutory bodies. He situated them in these areas. Razak used to go and visit, personally visit all the statutory bodies to see that they were doing what they were set up to do. All that is gone now. Huh? The statutory bodies were set up to bring about development in regional areas, the requisite infrastructure, water supply, electricity supply, also uh, now when we talk about uh, e-services, telecommunications, also important there in rural areas. There was also a serious focus on rural industries, developing rural industries in agriculture, in fisheries. Again, the whole of government approach, 
a particular institution has a role to play in terms of implementing. We talked about Tibet. Tibet is about education, completely different thing. And institutions were created to help promote Tibet, to bring about a link between companies doing the apprenticeship with uh, companies in government. The government-based institutions within education ministry were supposed to help with these linkages and so on and so forth. So we got a whole range of policies. The GLC uh, system have got different institutions to help with the implementation of these GLCs, the implementation of these policies. Is it happening? And who is coordinating all this? Who is sitting at the top and making sure this is all well coordinated in a way in which there's no uh, duplication of work? because there's serious duplication of work because there's no coordination. There's no one body having oversight. They have a policy, most ministers want to get into it. All of them will use the uh, GLCs under their control and citizens under control to implement it. That is not the way you implement public policies. Now I want to end with one particular thing. So who shall be at the top overseeing now, all this? That's the point that I said that the discussion is that there should be one coordinating council. In fact, before, do you know that Malaysia had a Ministry of Public Enterprise? We had a Ministry of Public Enterprises. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken, Rafida Aziz was the Minister of Public Enterprises because it's such a huge world. And then but that's part of the government. That is part of the government. That how can yes. we ensure there's a proper check and balance if, if they that, counsel talking, itself is a government itself? I'm talking here about the coordinating role. Mm -hmm. Talking about the coordinating role. I'm not talking here about what you are referring to is the governance. Uh, the public governance aspect. Yeah? I'm talking here about the coordination role. Public governance, we'll talk about separately. But you asked me a question on coordination, the whole of government approach. Mm -hmm. That's what I am looking at. That's what I'm discussing here. And we need to revisit those things. Huh? And do we want to have that model, a particular ministry in charge? Or do we use the current model, as you can see, and I showed you in the diagram, different ministries is decentralized, different ministries control their different GLCs. We have that model too. Now, right. the decentralized model is not working and it's leading to duplication of work. And now the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So do we need a more centralized model? Those are the debates uh, we need to get into. That's why, as I said, first we do a mapping. We see who who is doing what, and then we draw up the best oversight mechanism, the best coordination mechanism that we feel we can have. On governance, that's a separate issue. Huh? Then, then we go on to, okay, who has oversight of these institutions, the, the parliamentary select committee was discussed. Should directors be from among the members of the parliament? Those, that's a separate set of issues. Huh? But here we are talking about coordination. For me, that's, uh, that's quite crucial. I'd like to make one more point, which if I may, which is very important. If you want to develop all these industries, especially uh, in sectors like the high tech, which is capital intensive, where is the financing coming from? When we talk about an interventionist state, we also look at the links between the financial sector and the industrial sector, financial industrial linkages. Financial industrial links are very important to finance development in the sectors. Where does that come from? That would be returned to a different kind of financial institutions, the development financial institutions, the DFRs, SME Bank, Agro Bank, Export Import Bank, for example, Bank Pembangunan. Again, the, the whole of government approach. So if you want to develop particular sectors, how do you finance it? How do you bring the two sectors together, industrial sector, the tech sector, with the financial sector, bring them together? There must be someone who's coordinating all this and having oversight of all these things, because that's what the government is intervening for anyway. All that is not really well mapped out, well done, in Malaysia, which is why we're seeing all these problems that we're confronted with today. All right, thank you. Uh, perhaps one last question, Prof. I, I think I've been keep on receiving this. This is a WhatsApp message that please ask these questions for me. Uh, um, now, um, you mentioned in, in, in the presentation that there probably be a clash of interest and conflict when the Prime Minister himself sits as the Minister of Finance. Now, the, the, the perspective of a, of a civil servant uh, the, in terms of operationalization that it's good to have the prime minister that sits as the MOF as the minister of finance so that in any kinds of the government expenditure would not be 
be halted because it will actually be uh, proposed by the same person and then that, that kind of proposal will not be halted by a different person. Uh, so I think the, the, the questions and the person is asking is looking in terms of operationalizations of a government's budget and government expenditure. Though we know that the Minister of Finance should be really, really strict and be really independent and integrity, but the, the opinion is, it is operationally, it's okay to have the Minister of Finance who sit as the Prime Minister. Your comments, Prof. I'm glad uh, Ken Ming is here. I would like to hear Ken Ming's view on this. Ken Ming, the question posed by one listener is, they don't see a problem with the Prime Minister also serving as the Finance Minister. So before I let uh, Ken Ming gather his thoughts on this, let me speak first. I'm totally opposed to this. This comes back to your point about checks and balances, governance. If the Prime Minister comes up with a public policy as leader of the cabinet, the implementation, the financing of these ideas should be done by somebody else, the Minister of the Exchequer. There's always been in governance, there's always been this dichotomy, this distinction between the Prime Minister as Chief Executive and the, and the Exchequer. That's an important check and balance too. I come up with the policy and I want to make sure it's done my way. And here I'm quoting Mahate, my way. I want to do it my way. I asked the finance minister to do it. He's not doing it. So I'm going to become the finance minister and I'll do it my way. And you saw the outcomes. You saw the outcomes. We should go back in history and learn from history. When the prime minister became the finance minister, look at the outcomes under Mahathe, look at the outcomes also under Najib. And there's no checks and balance. There's no accountability here. There's no one to stop the prime minister from doing this because he controls the resources of the state too. So I'm afraid I have to say no to this. I haven't seen a practice like this in terms of good governance, good public governance. I haven't seen a system where they would allow for such a thing. Zukri, I'm done. Yes, Dr. Ong. I, I would agree with, strongly agree with that position uh, that mm -hmm. the Prime Minister should not hold the portfolio of Finance Minister. And that was something that we uh, implemented uh, during Pakata Harapan's uh, short tenure in government. Uh, but I would actually push further uh, to say that given the importance of the Ministry of Finance uh, position, uh, you know, basically to uh, be able to override many ministries, uh, including sometimes the Prime Minister's office. Uh, so for example, in the area of uh, Bumi Putra equity, for example, uh, uh, an issue was uh, answered in Parliament uh, with regards to these uh, Integrate, international Integrated Logistics Centers, uh, whether or not there's a need to implement a 51% Bumi equity uh, shareholding uh, retrospectively. Right? And this was a policy that was promoted, the, the, the International Integrated Logistics Services uh, uh, sector was something that was promoted uh, under MIDA, uh, which is uh, the Investment Promotion Agency uh, under BT. So, you know, the fact that the Ministry of Finance can overall rule these kinds of uh, in these kinds of policies that's that's uh, that, that is uh, promoted by other ministries, I think it 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 means that there needs to be uh, perhaps more oversight and checks on the power of the minister of finance as well. Uh, you know because uh, you know with the stroke of a pen, the minister of finance can do a lot. Probably a bit too much. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you both of you um, for all of your insights. Um, that is backed up by research as well as your day-to-day -day experience. Um, on behalf of Ideas, we also like to thank all of our listeners uh, and our participants who have been staying with us from the beginning until the end of the forum. I, I think um, we've learned a lot and it's an eye-opening too. Um, the COVID itself is an eye-opening as where we should do, what we should do with our GLCs and the GLICs. And I think uh, the road of reform has just started and there needs more to be done. At Ideas, we welcome all these kinds of discussions, feedback, criticisms, uh, to, to, to work further on, on these reforms. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, the Pantau Kwasa website is one of our ways uh, to actually reach to our audience out there in a very such interactive and and collaborative manner. 
Uh, and if you do have any feedbacks uh, as far as the website is concerned, as well as this topic is concerned, please write it down. Uh, I think there's an the email at admin at pantakwasa.com. Uh, we'll definitely be happy to hear all of your feedbacks for us to improve the work of this reform, the website itself to advocate the reforms that we are doing. Um, before we end the session today, uh, again, thank you, um, Sir, Professor Dr. Edmund Terence Gomez, uh, for being with us today with all of your insights and research. Also, our thanks to Yang Berhormat, Dr. Ong Kiam Mink, uh, for also sharing with your experience as a member of parliament who sits in, in, in the legislative role today. I would like to also bring the attention of all of us here to the next event, which is quite controversial as well, but it's definitely good. Tomorrow, there will be another uh, ideas forum and a report launched on the public procurement and Bumiputra company development in construction industry. Uh, we will talk about its policies as well as possibilities of reform. Now, the report on public procurement and Bumiputra company development uh, is done by Dr. Lee Ho Ant, uh, one of our ideas uh, senior fellow, who's also attached to ICS Singapore. Uh, he will be then doing the presentations of the report and then there will be a reviewer from uh, Prof. Dr. Jamaluddin. Uh, he's actually from the Persatuan Contractor Bumi Putra Malaysia as well as Dr. Rohana, the Dean School of Law uh, from UUM and it will be moderated by uh, Sri Murmiyati, our staff. So again, there's a kind of similar discussions going on in terms of public procurement and transparency. So if this is an interest to all of you, please join us tomorrow. It's at the same time, 10 a.m. to 12 noon uh, for this discussion. So once again, I just like to thank all of you for your support. Please keep us in our, your newsletter. Please read our newsletters, all our tutors and link in announcement. I will definitely be there to keep on providing you on the reform works that we have done, advocating you what's the best for our country, Malaysia. Thank you, have a very good lunch, have a really nice day. Stay safe, stay pleasant, and stay positive, everyone. Thank you all. <laughs>